Hello and welcome to the Catch the Lift Coaches Corner. I'm Cal Coach and Program Director Melissa, and this week I'm honored to welcome Scott Martin to the show. Scott is a U.S. Army veteran, Cal veteran athlete, and so very much more. Welcome to this week's episode of the Coaches Corner. Scott, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you having me, and and I appreciate you uh, using the term athlete to describe me. I uh, take that as quite a compliment. I don't consider myself a, quite an athlete, but um, I appreciate it anyway. And we, we certainly consider you one, Scott. We certainly consider all of our veterans athletes. Thank you so very much for taking the time with us today. Let's hop right into it, Scott. You know, let's start today. Would you talk to us a little bit about your life growing up, Scott, and ultimately what would lead you into the military? Okay. Well, uh, I, I was born and raised in a small bayside um, community uh, in Swansea, Massachusetts, and the area that I lived in was called Ocean Grove. It was right on, I'm sorry, it was right on the water, and uh, so I spent most of my life uh, doing stuff that had to do with water. I, I caught seafood and you know swam and just you know during the summer it was it was great um so yeah and then up until about um i would say about seven years old i had a pretty average um childhood you know but then my uh parents split up and uh we would spend time with each parent, my brother and I. And I, I guess I developed some uh, animosity and, and became uh, rebellious. And, um, you know, just not an all around good child. Um, so at some point, uh, we were sent to go live with our father. And, I think it was probably around the freshman year in high school, and in my sophomore year, I was expelled from the Massachusetts school uh, system um, for various uh, things. So at that point, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't going to school. I wasn't working. I was sitting home basically just partying while my dad worked all day and, you know, drinking his beer and, you know, just had no goals in life and, right. and no direction. So at one point I was given an ultimatum, you know, either get out, get a job or, or join the military. And, you know, I, I didn't have a drive to join the military. I, I had a, uh, uh, an ultimatum. And right. I, I kind of thought that maybe that would have been the easy way out. Um, but it wasn't. And I found that out real quick. Uh, I, w I wasn't a good soldier. I always just got by. Um, uh, where I shined was out in the field, getting dirty, and, yeah. and you know, get in the, the mud, but in the barracks uh, where you had the iron and spit shine. And, and right. I got bored, and I, I ended up getting into a lot of trouble. So I, I didn't have a real... Um, great military career. Um, I spent 22 years in, and I got out as an E4. So, you know, that should tell you something. But, um, so yeah, I didn't have a drive, but I, I enjoyed it uh, for the most part. Uh, more so at the beginning, less so towards the end. Um, I think I was ready to get out towards the end, so... Um, so yeah, that's that's it. I uh, was a troubled kid, uh, my own doing. Um, so joined the military to try to you know right. make something, thinking it was the easy way. Just it was for me. It wasn't for me. I, I don't know. I had a love hate relationship with it. Yeah. Uh, I did a number of different jobs while I was in the military. So. so Let's, I want to touch on a couple of those with you, Scott, because like you said, you know, your, your career spanned, you know, over 20 years. Um, and one of the things you did, you were a drill sergeant for a period of time. 
Would you talk to us a little bit about that experience? Well, it's funny because I never pictured myself as a drill sergeant. <laughs> I really don't have that inbred nature that a drill sergeant has. So it was, it was, it was interesting. Uh, again, I, I got by. Yeah. Um, I was a reserve drill sergeant, so there wasn't a whole lot expected out of me. Okay. Um, so again, it, it was interesting, but what I found interesting was that now I was the person doing the yelling and the screaming, yeah. you know, but I was also up teaching classes, and, and that was where, where I also shined. I'm, I'm a teacher, okay. so uh, I, I really liked that part of it. Uh, I'm more of a mellow-natured person. I'm not a screamer. Right. You know, so uh, ultimately it just didn't work out. I did it for a couple of years. It was fun. Uh, it's a, a check mark. Yeah. You know. Scott, would you would you talk to us a little bit about you know becoming an MP and deploying to Iraq as a military police officer? Sure. I was I was stationed here at the local armory. Uh, with the 29th Infantry uh, Light, and basically I was assigned to uh, a desk person, and I was the gopher. Okay. I'd get him paper, whatever he needed, and I was kind of bored with that. Well, at that point, they started doing some restructuring, and uh, they said that they wanted to have start a, an MP unit. Okay. There'd be two detachments, one here, and, and one in the next town over, with the main unit being up in Northern Virginia. And uh, I thought, great, you know, MP, I'm gonna drive around, hand out tickets. Uh, sure. I didn't realize, yeah, I didn't realize that there were different types of yeah. uh, MPs. Right. And what I did was I signed up as a combat uh, support MP. Uh, which meant we were basically an infantry soldier, but with more equipment right. and, and more weight. So I was roughly uh, 45 years old at the time. I was looking to get out of the infantry and thought that would be my way out. But lo and behold, uh, it dragged me back in right. and, little, and beat me up that even worse. Life. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it was interesting. You know, people would ask, I don't know how you do it. <clears throat> you know, I was the second oldest person in my platoon, uh, in, my, in my small company. So uh, they were amazed that I could just keep on going, you know. And I just had to tell them, slow and, and steady. That's, yeah. that's the way to go. So. Scott, talk to us about the deployment to Iraq, if you would. The uh, deployment to Iraq, because we were just a company size unit, we, uh, we were attached to a number of different um, brigades, okay. and, which meant we bounced around a bit. And uh, for the first mm, good bit of the deployment, we were living in tents uh, because we were, we were bouncing around. And then... Uh, let's see, that was in uh, Basra, okay. we were in Basra, uh, which the, uh, the, the Brits were still in control of at the time when we arrived there. Uh, we then transitioned over um, from them uh, a couple weeks later. Scott, what was that transition like with the Brits to you guys? Uh, it was interesting uh, because at the time we were eating in the British mess hall, so we were eating the food that they were eating, which was actually rather healthy. Um, and then when we took over, the hamburgers came out, uh, the hot all dogs, the, all the you know, fried, the food? food, oh, the my fried God. foods, and you know. Yeah. But there were there were a few nights where they had like Mongolian barbecue. Or they'd have a, a steak and, and a surf and turf, uh, something like that. But for the most part, it was uh, basic military food. Yeah, yep. So uh, I did learn to drink instant coffee because that's all the Brits 
drink in the way of coffee because they like their tea. Okay. Uh, but they do put instant coffee out for those that do like it. So. Interesting. And I still drink it to this day. I drink instant coffee in the afternoon. Do you? So yeah, oh, yeah. Incredible. So that stuck with you. Very cool. So Scott, talk to us a little bit about being in Iraq as a military police officer. What were you guys doing kind of on, you know, typical day is a bad word, right? You're in war, but what kind yeah. of did your days look like? Uh, you know, the days were rather typical. We did, uh, some days we did uh, humanitarian missions where we'd go to the local schools. We'd bring uh, school supplies, pass out uh, book bags with pens and pencils and notepads and what was stuff that like, like that. To, what was that like to get to, you know, go like that and do a humanitarian missions like that where you're working directly with the civilian population? Uh, I liked it. Yeah. Um, again, that, that feeds into my, my trainer or teacher yeah. uh, personality. Absolutely. Uh, it was nice to see the kids smiling. Yeah. Um, and just getting the supplies that they need. Yeah. Unfortunately, on the back side of that, um, we had some Iraqi police that would come and take the stuff back yeah. after we left and then sell it. Oh, um, geez. Yeah. On the black market. So, yeah. And eventually they were caught doing that and transferred out. So. Yeah. So Scott, you you mentioned to me when we talked before that you know you guys had a part in training like the Iraqi police or Iraqi soldiers. Um, talk to us a little bit about that experience and and when you get to it too, if you would touch on the PT aspect of it. Okay. Well, we we would arrive at a, a police station, and they would open up the gates, and we would come in, and basically what our job was is to get the um, facial recognition, recognition software up so these people can be ID'd, okay. the, the Iraqi police can be ID'd so they know who they are because they had no idea who these people were, they just took them off the street, um, handed them a yeah. gun, uh, so they had no idea about inventory, who had what, how many guns they had out, so that was another part of our, our mission there. Uh, the other uh, part of our mission there was to try to get them in some type of shape, forming them up in the morning, doing uh, just basic PT for, for a few minutes, you know, 20 minutes or whatever, for as long as they could stand it anyway. And, you know, you try to get them to do something as simple as a jumping jack. And they just didn't seem to have the coordination to do it or... Uh, <laughs> I think it was a combination of the coordination and the will. They didn't have the will to even want to do it. Uh, they, they were very strong people, but they're very lazy. It, they're hardworking, but they're lazy. They're very slow in everything that they do, of course, because it's so hot there. Right. Um, they, have to, they have to do everything slow. And a lot of work gets done in the evening uh, when the sun goes down. So yeah, trying to get them to uh, do things was a little difficult. Yeah. How did that? How did that kind of play on the side of you, Scott? Like the you know the teacher side was it was it frustrating? Did you know were you frustrated by that work with them, or you know was it enjoyable and something that you could kind of turn to that side of yourself? Well, it, it wasn't worth getting frustrated for. It's the, it's the people. Right. You can't just right. come, come into a country and change people. It's, it's like somebody coming here to the United States and telling us you got to do things this way. It's right. Who they are. And you take it with a grain of salt. Uh, you do the best job you can. And, and then you move on. And ultimately, it's on them how good they want to be or how much training they want because they had all the training they desired if they wanted it. So. Yeah. Scott, looking back on that 12 month deployment, you know, in Iraq as a military police officer, um, what kind of stands out to you most now looking back or what's most memorable to you looking back? Well, there were times when uh, a medic could not make it out on patrols with us. And because of my background, 
uh, I was working on the fire department. I was a EMT with the with the fire department. So I had the medical background to begin with. So I, I basically became the medic on, okay. on patrols where he couldn't. Uh, and I really liked that because it put me in touch with the civilian uh, yeah. people. Um, I, you know, you see, come across babies full of sand flea bites and, you know, they're just miserable. And you try to give them something to, to uh, ease that, you know, and, and you can see the smiles on their faces when it, when it works. You know, so it, it, it was really amazing. I, I really like learning about new cultures and about people. And that aspect of being there was, was great. Um, it was also dirty. Yeah. Um, very dirty and trashy. And um, their uh, hygiene is not like ours. So that took a lot of getting used to. Um, usually when we came in from patrols, we washed everything off uh, to get some of that yeah. uh, human waste okay. and whatnot off the vehicles and yeah. boots, whatever. Right. Scott, thank you so much for your service to our great country. Truly, thank you. Talk to us a little bit about that transition home from Iraq. Well, we, we got sent home. Of course, we were in the National Guard, so we got brought in, and um, things start to get a little foggy from, from then on in for a few years. But I think we came back, and it was nighttime. So there was very little of anything. We came home, and that was it. And then uh, I was told, you know, to uh, that I had to take care of the medical board myself, uh, rather than put me in a warrior transition unit and and have me take care of it. Then they sent me home, so I had to deal with the VA and and uh, all that. Uh, my wife and I, uh, basically my wife. <laughs> I was in no condition to be looking for paperwork and this and that. And, um, we had, at one time, we had five, probably five sleeves of paper, paperwork, medical records that we had to present to the, the med board. Right. Well, I turned them into the unit. The unit would lose them. We'd have to print them out again. And, you know, a couple of times we ran them up to state ourselves to make sure that they, they got them in hand. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was very tra tricky transitioning yeah. out of the unit. Um, it was difficult uh, dealing with the VA, but persistence pays off. Um, yes, very true. I, yep. I actually got service connected rather quickly. It was a rather low percentage, but uh, what I did was I went to the emergency room at the VA and said, I need to see a doctor. Yeah. And I went in, I just went to see him for, I don't know, my back or something, just yep. just to get me in in there. And and it wasn't uh, three, three to six months later, I was service-connected, um, I think 10%. Okay. But now your foot's in the door, yep. and, and you just work on things one at a time. You can't throw a bunch of things at them and, and expect it to work. So it takes a long time. It takes a lot of persistence, um, a lot of cursing to myself, not to them. Um, but with the help of my wife, uh, mostly because of my wife, uh, we got through the VA system and, and got that uh, straight. Uh, as far as our personal lives go, um, all I was looking forward to was getting home and walking into the house that I left before I went to Iraq. And I walked in the house and it was the same house, but it wasn't the same. Yeah. It wasn't the same. And no matter what I did to try to make it the same, 
it seemed to make it worse. And the more I did, the more upset my wife got, and the more upset my wife got, the more I wanted to fix it. And, you know, it, it went on and on and on. And I was doing some bad things. And um, our marriage took a, a real hard hit. Um, we've gone through many years of marriage counseling. Um, I, I tried to push her away. Luckily, she's even more stubborn than I am. And she said, I'm absolutely not leaving. And we're going to get through this. And she would find little quotes and and stuff to stick up everywhere that I, I could see them. Yep. And uh, she, she stuck a quote up on the refrigerator. And it really hit home. And I'd like to read it real quick. Yes, please read I, that. I hope it helps. Yes, I hope please it helps read somebody us quote, Scott. And the, it looks like the quote is by a person called Joseph Campbell. And the quote goes like this, we must be willing to get rid of the life we've planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. Until you let the past go and stop fighting to try to make it the past again, except that it's not gonna be the same. There's just no way. Neither neither person is the same person. So, um, until you accept that and really take that into your heart, you can't finally say, you know, you're right. I have a new life now, yeah. but why can't it be a better version of, of the life that I have now? Yeah. Thank so, you, for, you, thank know, you for sharing that quote with us, Scott. That's a, that's yeah. incredible. It's not a, a, a easy journey. Yeah. And, you know, there were times where I didn't think we were going to make it, but I'm glad we did. And things things are good. We still have our problems, but they're not uh, beyond work being worked. So, so Scott, let's let's talk about that a little more because right that that quote was a was a huge catalyst for change in you right and changing you know the way you were thinking about about your life and your future so how would your life kind of unfold for you from that point well i was dealing with a lot of issues like uh, agoraphobia um i i didn't want to leave the house um i didn't want to be around people I didn't trust people. I didn't certainly didn't want to be out in public. And eventually I got into my backyard and I do some crazy stuff in my backyard. And, uh, you know, patrolling the backyard with my dog, sleeping out there in a pup tent, you know, wearing my combat gear. I mean, I was in pretty bad shape. Uh, and, and I think a lot of it had to do with the medications I was on, okay. and I was going having psychotic uh, events. So um, once I started getting outside, um, I was I was introduced uh, to an outdoor trip, um, and against my better judgment, I decided to go, which got me out. Yeah in public with other vets, um, got me out in the outdoors, and from then on in, I mean, it wasn't instantaneous, yeah. but it was little steps. Right. You know, that was four days. Well, heck, now I'm home, I got mountains right here, I can go up there by myself, you know, and spend a couple of days and just soul search. And So you kept kind of building on this. I did. I just yeah. kept building, and then uh, one trip here and a trip there. You know, all all vets with uh, trips with veterans. Yep. Um, because that was a big part of of what I was missing as well. So it, and and they're hurting as well. For sure. So it was good for us to be together and to talk, and then you learn about other things, other trips and and this and that, and it just it steamrolls yeah. and. I think I told you at one year I did like 10 or 11 trips and they were like four or five. One was 11 days, you know, it was, 
So at that point, my wife said, next year, no more trips. <laughs> Slow her down. You're going to spend time with me. And, <laughs> yeah. But it, it was like I found a new drug, something I had been missing, right? Because I grew up in the outdoors. I, sure, I yes. hunted and fished with my dad. Uh, I, I lived in, on the bay. So the outdoors is a big part. I lost that. So not only did I lose that, but I also lost my job as a firefighter. Um, and I was medically retired from the military. All the things I loved, right. I didn't have anymore. So I lost self-respect, you know, and, and then I got on the pity pool, oh, poor me, and, you know. Right, yep. And it, it just kept... Um, getting worse and worse, and, and I tried committing suicide a couple times. Um, I'm glad I, I didn't succeed, um, because now I'm, I'm in a good place, yeah. and people who loved me would not be in a bad, a good place. You know what I mean? Right, absolutely. So it's kind of a selfish thing to do that to somebody. And Sky. I hate to see it. Well, no, I mean, we're, thank you, thank you for sharing that with us. And I mean, we're obviously so very glad that you're here with us today to spread your light and talk about this, right? Right. Um, you and I both know that this is a reality, unfortunately, in our community, suicide, suicide ideation. Um, if it's all right, Scott, if I can ask you, you know, would you talk a minute to anybody listening that's, that's, you know, struggling with these things? What would you say to them today? Well, the, the first thing they have to understand is their mind frame at the time. They think they're thinking clearly, but their mind is twisted for all kinds of reasons. And, you know, PTSD, anxiety, depression, but uh, troubles at home, I mean, so at that point, they're not making a, a, a sound decision. They're making a decision that they think would, people would be better off right. uh, if they weren't here. All they're doing is causing hurt, and I got this insurance policy, and my wife will be taken care of for the rest of her life, and, you know, the kids, and, and they don't realize that it's blood money, basically. It's, they would rather have their husband, yeah, father, you know, brother there. And uh, there was uh, a few weeks, two weeks last uh, fall where I worked for military funerals for four local young veterans who took their own lives. Oh, gosh. Um, and I knew two of them. So, yeah, it was really tough. I, I really hate to see that. Yeah. And, you know, I know where they are, and I wish I could just reach out and, you know, through the Internet and say, I know where you are, you know. Just yeah. Talk to me. But So I want to kind of bridge over here a minute, Scott, because, you okay. know, with that, you are – you are very active in your community. You are very active in the veteran community. One of them being uh, with your VFW that you're the commander for. Would you talk to us a little bit about that, Scott, and how that has allowed you to connect with other veterans, you know, and, and share yourself with them? Sure. Uh, well, as I said earlier, I, I lost three major parts of my life that made me part of my community. I had, you know, the trust in my community. I had a good relationship, and I lost all that. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I needed a way to get back involved since I couldn't do that anymore. And my cousin at the time was uh, the commander at the VFW. And he said, hey, why don't you come to join the VFW? We'll pay your first year's membership dues, you know. So I said, okay. And then I went. And then he stepped down, and things happened, and I stopped going for a couple of years. And then I, I think I got a call from them and said, hey, you want to come back? Or whatever. Somehow I got reconnected yep. <clears throat> uh, with them and uh, eventually became the commander. Uh, so our post, our big thing is 
uh, we hold bingo each week, which oh, cool. uh, brings in a lot of money. Yeah. Well, you know, out of that money, we got to pay the gaming commissions, you know, this and that, taxes, yeah, blah, blah, right. blah. And 10% of it has to go back to the community. So 10% of whatever we, we bring in um, that month, we, uh, at our meeting, we um, give money to whatever charities we vote on to give to. Um, and they're all veteran, either veteran charities or uh, charities that help veterans indirectly right. and their families. So uh, since 2018, we've given over $300,000 uh, back to the community. Wow, uh, that's since, tremendous. Absolutely since tremendous. Since June of last year, we've given, and and I'm hoping these numbers are right, somewhere around $55,000. Incredible. So it, the bingo was a big help. Yes. Um, the uh, veterans, the veterans that are there, uh, unfortunately, are uh, older. The Korean War. We've got one or two uh, World War Two. One of them just passed, unfortunately. Um, so the numbers are dwindling. Right. You know, so it's always a push, a membership push. You try to get some of these younger people, but these older posts, a lot of them don't have uh, anything to offer. They don't have the, the bars open anymore, so there's no alcohol. Yeah. You know, there's nothing to attract families because they want to spend time with their families. Right. You know, they don't do dinners. So it, it's getting very tough, and, and we need to seriously think about how we can change uh, post-wise in order to attract younger members to keep the post alive. And that's always been a struggle uh, for me, and right. I think for the, the commanders prior to me as well. What do you uh, we are also the only post in my district that um, has the ability to help an individual vet if he's struggling with finances, okay. um, behind in his rent. They can come to us. They have to show us proof, uh, the bills, and we write the checks out directly to the uh, utility or That's to the saying. landlord, yeah. and we, we pay that. It's, it's not a loan. They don't have to pay yep. it back. Uh, it's just another way of us giving back. So that's wonderful. Wow. Um, so Scott, I want to just step back one second here, you know, and, and talk a little bit about, um, you know, the VFWs and kind of like the the OEF OIF generation. Because mm -hmm. I and you know, I'm I'm obviously not an expert at this or on this, mm -hmm. but it it seems like you know what you're describing with the post is kind of how it is nationwide. I know it is here, you know, in my local town and the towns next to me, uh, the VFWs, you know, it, it's primarily um, Korean War and, you know, Vietnam veterans and such. And, you know, you might have, if you're lucky, one or two OEF, OIF vets in it. Um, but the membership or the the drive certainly isn't there. Do you have, you know, and you touched on a little bit like some of the difficulties, but do you have just off the top anything you think that be, could happen in these in these local VFWs to kind of get OEF, OIF that's engaged? Well, one thing um, they have to realize, uh, a, a lot of these soldiers coming home are on medication and are not supposed to be drinking. Yep. So it, it's always this uh, seesaw effect, yeah. you know, well, they're, they're adults, but other people can drink, so why should we stop them? And, yeah. But I've heard a lot of people say, oh, all it is is a clubhouse for, for uh, uh, old vets and this and that, and it's not a clubhouse. Yeah. It's, it's a canteen where they can go and drink. Well, we don't have that at our post. Yeah. We did, and it got voted out. But we need to try to do something else with that space. We can make it kind of a USO. Yeah, right. Um, maybe put some game machines in there, some uh, some uh, uh, Xboxes or something. Right. Because I know they like to play. They can bring their families and have, you know, tournaments, you know, game tournaments, whatever. I mean, there's so many things that can be done. Yeah. The problem is it takes money and it takes um, people Yes. 
it takes bodies to get this stuff done. And unfortunately, I think I have about uh, maybe 10 on a good night that make it to meetings. And I would say three of them are of uh, an age where they're still able to do and yep. the rest of them are not and they've been doing stuff for 30 right 35 yeah. years you know and they they have the mentality of, well we've already tried it it didn't work yeah. you know well who are you going to get to to do this you know it, it's 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 very frustrating yeah um to change the mentality of the old timers right yes to say hey maybe we could do it differently and see, and if it doesn't work, we haven't lost anything, yeah. but maybe we'll gain something. Um, we have to do something other than just bingo once a week. Uh, unfortunately, my post is basically a bingo hall yeah. where the VFW meets. Right. And, yep. and that's not the way it should be because it's a VFW hall who holds bingo. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if there's not one answer. I'd like to bring electronic gaming machines in, yeah. you know, attract those people there, you know, that like to play those games. Right. Then who's going to sit there and, and mind the, uh, the VFW all day? Yeah. You know, we don't have an auxiliary anymore, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's. And unfortunately, the, the VFW, um, in order to remain a voice in. Washington, they have to be above a million members. Okay. If you fall below a million members, you are no longer considered a voice in Washington. I didn't know that. And 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 people aren't going to listen to you. Yeah. So unfortunately, the VFW at this point has started using auxiliary members in the numbers. Really. To keep the 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 numbers up, because we're we're just losing members and we're not. We're not able to replace them. Oh, wow! Yeah, that's a that's a whole can of worms on that side. Wow! Thank you right. for. And, thank and you it's for not just that. that. It's not just that. It's the churches. It's the yeah. volunteer fire departments. Right. Yes. I mean, everybody is is just they can't. It's hard to yeah. get by. Right. Yeah. It's 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 certainly not just VFW specific. No. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to that, Scott. Um, I want to ask you a bit, you know, now about, about your fitness journey and kind of, you know, fitness, nutrition, wellness. You've got a lot, a lot, a lot of great stuff going on there. Right. Um, talk to us, Scott, about, about your individual fitness journey and kind of where you're at now with it. Okay. Well, uh, a brief back history, uh, somewhere around middle school, um, I was involved with the Catholic Youth Organization. I did a little boxing, and uh, I was also got involved with some weight training. So that was my uh, introduction to exercise. I had a, a guy come to the house and train me each week, um, who actually trained Charles Atlas. Um, he was his his trainer, so I thought that was pretty cool. So he was probably seventy five by the time he came Very to train cool. me, but. Uh, so then, uh, when I went into the service, I boxed a little bit um, when I was stationed in Germany for the post team, and then came home and worked out every evening when I got home from work. I had a gym up on the third floor. I, I went up there, spent a couple hours, and that went on for a while. But then life took over. I got married, and you know, blah, blah. Right, yep. And uh, got out of fitness for many, many years. <laughs> Um, even in the military, I wasn't yeah. top notch. I, I got by, you know, yeah. but, um, so it, it wasn't until, um, last July and up until that point, you know, I saw myself in pictures, you know, over the years and, you know, I was disgusted with the way I looked and. You know, couldn't understand why my wife was still attracted to me, you know. And in a second here, I'll pull up a picture of my face from back then and I'll kind of put it, and you can see. But anyway, uh, in July of last year, my wife and I went 
skydiving. And on her landing, she broke her ankle. Oof. So she was going to be laid up for um, at least six to eight weeks. Okay. And in order to um, make sure that she was comfortable and eating well and not just a bunch of junk and gaining a ton of weight. Right. Um, I decided that I would start cooking healthy. And it wasn't like I did a complete change, but I did what I called smart eating or conscientious eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, instead of having mashed potatoes, I'd have a sweet potato. Okay. Or yeah. having, you know, a six ounce steak, I'd have a, a three ounce steak and toss in a salad. Yep. You know, so it was just little changes like that. And um, I noticed that it was starting to work. And I'm the type of person where if I see something starting to work, I'm going to take it all the way because yeah. that's yeah. just what I do with everything <laughs> I do. Right. I give 100%. So um, I had some resistance bands that I had gotten from uh, Catch a Lift. Uh, whew, maybe the year prior, and they just sitting around, you know, and I hadn't really done anything with them, so I pulled them out, I started messing around with them, and then uh, I got contacted about my grant um, being up again. Yeah. So I got a TRX uh, suspension trainer, awesome. and also the... Um, the rip trainer and a, a, a heavy set of flat resistance bands, okay. something to help me with my pull ups. Yeah. Because I didn't have the shoulder strength, so I needed something to help uh, with my pull ups. So I, I started taking that with me everywhere. Um, when I went on a trip or whatever, uh, it was it was small, it fit in a suitcase, it was fun, and I liked it. And basically what I did was I used that to get my muscles working. Um, I wasn't looking to do heavy body stuff with it, but I wanted to get my muscles working. They'd been sedentary for 10 years, right. you know, other than yard work or, or fishing, hiking, whatever. So uh, I did. I, and I got to the point where I noticed some muscle definition coming back. Um, I'm losing some weight, so I can now I can see some muscles in my yeah. stomach, not just a round belly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I just continued, and I, the more I saw it, the, the more I did. Yeah. So yeah. then I started, uh, um, what did I do? Oh, I got a, a dip bar, which I attached my TRX trainer to, and then uh, also an exercise bike. So now I've added a little cardiovascular. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of my health history. I have COPD. Uh, I have asthma. And um, I have uh, arthritis in all my joints and degenerative joint disease and this disease. So uh, I'm always in a, a bit of pain, right. uh, and I'm yeah. always a, a bit of out of breath. So yeah. I, it's not like I can push like I was 30 anymore. Right. So yeah. uh, basically, what I did was I started on the bike, and I found that I was comfortable on it, and I could really push. So I liked it. So I added that. I did, you know, uh, started off at 20 minutes, and then went to 30 minutes, and then 45 minutes. So I was doing that, and I was working with the TRX, and then uh, uh, watching my weight. Uh, my The biggest thing I wanted, I wasn't looking to build muscle at this point. I was looking to build some definition, okay. get my muscles used to, to working again, right. and losing weight. That was my main focus, yep. was to lose weight. And my, my weight goal was 165. When I started uh, in July, I was 231, uh, but I had gone as high as uh, 238. Okay. 
uh, maybe even sneaking up at, to 240 as, at one point. Yep. Um, so uh, I finally reached my weight goal, and I reached it a month and a half earlier than expected. Oh, uh, congratulations, so, Scott. Yeah, I, I, I was really happy about that. Uh, this last week, I, I put on uh, the, the five pounds, so I have to work on that. Uh, but my back is getting to the point now where I think in the next day or two, I'll be able to get back out and, and work. Right yeah. now, I think the muscles are still trying to loosen up. So it's the muscle tension. It's yeah. not the hip anymore. So uh, okay. hopefully, um, I've been trying to find this picture. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm distracting no, here. No, no, you're good. You're good. Um, I'm just going to ask you while you're looking there, Scott. Um, sure. So like you said, you know, got back involved, you know, you were involved with Catch a Lift, you know, over the summer. How did you initially even find out about Catch a Lift? You know, I, I can't be for sure. Okay. Um, it could have been one of my veteran buddies. Yeah. Okay. Who mentioned it on Facebook. And, and then I said, hey, what's Catch a Lift? And then I looked it up and then I applied. Yeah. Um, it could have been a Catch a Lift uh, ad on Facebook. I, I'm not exactly sure. No, that's all good. I was just curious. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, I got, uh, I wasn't sure how it worked at the time. I didn't realize it tiered or, yep. or whatever. So they start you off with, I got resistance bands. And I guess they want to make sure that you're going to follow through with that routine and, and, and not just, you know, hit you with a bunch of equipment. Yeah. And then right. you're never going to use it. So. Yep. I think that's really great that they do that. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's that picture. And All right. I don't know if you can. Oh, we can see it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's incredible. You're a completely different man. Look at that. Wow. I thought that, I thought that was funny. Seriously. So, tremendous work, Scott. Congratulations on that weight loss. Absolutely. So tremendous. now I'm at the point where um, I'm adding weight. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I only got one session in before my back went out. Uh, but so now I'm lo looking to build definition. I'm not trying to build bulk. I want to tighten up. I want to tighten up some of this loose flab yeah, good. Um, from losing the weight. And I want to build some muscle, and I just want to define it. Uh, I'm not ready to go into competition, bodybuilding competition. <laughs> uh, I'm a middle-aged, you know... Uh, better than middle-aged, married man, you know, just, I'll push the best I can and I'll get, you know, to where I'm comfortable. And I, I need to build my chest and my shoulders and flatten my belly if I can get rid of this damn fat. I'm sorry. No, you're um, good. You're good. Well, I don't know what it is. This belly flat just wants to hang on, you know. It's, like it's one of the last places to, to drop for sure. But exactly, stay consistent with that. You're having tremendous results, Scott. Um, I have just a couple more questions I want to ask you today. Um, and one of them, you know, you've already kind of spoken to it, but could you could you really put into us some words, Scott, what it's meant to you, you know, having the, the home equipment from Catch a Lift, what that's done for your life? As I stated years ago, I, I bodybuild, I've worked out wasn't a bodybuilder, but I worked out, and, and I was pretty big. In middle school, they called me Little Hulk, so that would give you an idea of what I looked like in yeah. middle school, but I, I always miss that, and the older I get, you know, you think back, and you know, what if, and so I, I always wanted to get back into it, but then I'm fat, and you know, it's easier just to eat a cookie, and, and then... By happenstance, uh, this incident with with my wife, uh, it brought me back in. And I'll tell you, if it wasn't for catch a lift, um, I wouldn't have gotten where I am now because uh, being on a fixed income, yeah. didn't have the extra money to buy gym equipment or, right. or whatever. So... Um, that's where Catch a Lift shined. It got me the equipment and it allowed me to be able to do what I want to do um, if I want to do it. And, right. and that's the thing. You, you can have all the equipment in the world, oh, but absolutely. if you're not going to use it. Yep. So I'm hoping that um, 
by this time next year, I was thinking that I wanted to compete in a, in a bicycle race. Okay, yeah. Um, there's a couple races, not really races, but bike rides going on here over the, the course of the year. I want to see how I do with those. Uh, I don't have a bike. I have to get a bike. Um, but that was what I originally set out to do. I don't know if my goals are too high, but that's what I'm oh, going never to. never too high. Oh, my gosh. I'm right. So next so year, I want to compete in something. Yeah. I'm not sure what. So I'm hoping to, I'll get through this phase of the weight training. Yes. Um, maintain the weight, uh, develop the weight training, get myself into some type of um, condition to uh, compete in something. Uh, I'm taking some uh, personal classes right now, uh, strength training 101, uh, where they're going to help uh, set up a training plan with me uh, based on my needs. And Good. I'm going to go with that and see how it goes. And, and use some of that old school theory that I got from back in middle school. And, I like it. Yeah. I like it. Well, please know, Scott, I mean, we are here rooting you on hard, and I know you're going to crush these goals that you're setting because that's what you do. You keep building on, on your momentum. I have one last question for you today, Scott. What does it mean to you to be a catch -a -lift veteran athlete? And you certainly are an athlete, Scott. What does it mean? Well, I have a hard time with that word, <laughs> athlete. I've never been an athlete in anything. But anyway, getting over that, uh, it means that I belong to something. Um, I belong to a, a group of like-minded people who uh, take fitness seriously, use it as a way to um, uh, heal and move on. Um, It's, it's so much. It's the, even the offline help, the, uh, the, the uh, coach's corner, the nutrition uh, tabs, the workout tabs. Uh, it's just a whole, the whole thing is just a great program. And I try to tell everybody I know about it. Oh, thank you. you. Know, get them in, involved. So Absolutely. Thank you for doing that. Certainly, Scott. Keep so everybody the out there listening, get involved with Cal. Catch a lift fun. Heck yeah, you heard it here. You heard uh, Scott's results. You see him <laughs> grinding and the tremendous work he's doing. 73 oh, pounds. Oh, my God. 73 pounds since July. Tremendous. Tremendous, Scott. Excellent work. Congratulations. Very, very Thanks. happy for you. Very happy for you. And we are all so excited to continue to watch your fitness journey unfold. Yeah, I'm glad to have you in my corner. Absolutely. We're glad to have you, Scott. Thank that, you. That's it for this week's episode of Coach's Corner. We will return next Wednesday at 1 Eastern time with another episode. Scott, thank you so very much for coming on today, being vulnerable with us, sharing your story and your light with us all. Absolutely tremendous. And thank you so much for your service to our great country. Thank you to ID Technologies for your support of this podcast and all things Catch a Lift. Thank you to Lynn Coughlin, Henry Pomper, and Kaylee Nasiri for all the hard work you all do every week to make this, pos this podcast possible. And we thank the entire Catch a Lift team. Don't forget to join us every Wednesday live at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube for a chance to win Cal swag and a chat with your brothers and sisters. Until next week, keep it real and stay Cal strong. Bye.